I'm going to go back on, on Doug's first question here. Uh, I suppose uh, it's been kicked to me. This is one of the things that I think the, the, the intended nationally determined contributions are extremely important. Uh, and I've been going around the world talking about, and you could talk about the economics of, of these clean energy systems and the fact that they're better um, and you know, more economic, uh, but they are a little bit less straightforward. You haven't tried them before. Uh, and there's, there is, a, you know, if you're walking into South Africa or Malawi or Mozambique or Ghana, and we've done this a number of times, uh, pr prior to COP, and you talk about clean energy systems, this kind of transition, and, and you get the response, uh, well, you know, why should we do this? And, and, and it was a complicated response. And now it's a very, very simple response. Often, when you go in and have an INDC, they've said what they want to do. And, and when, you, when you go in, and, and, and so in a way, the, this has really helpfully linked the, the global with the local, because they have already stated what their desires are. So in terms of my own facilitation as, a, as an advisor talking to these people, it's, it's much easier You say, well, you know, I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm merely advising you on how you could go about achieving the goals that you've set for yourself. And, uh, and, and that's a watershed change that, that we've had over the last eight months to be able to actually say that when, when you go into a country, and it just makes life uh, a lot easier and, and, and moves, um, moves things into the, into the system. I don't know if anybody has uh, other comments on yeah. Oh, it's maybe a little bit. Uh, oh. oh, that's on. Okay, so if I, when I heard your statement about uh, the complexity of local, global, actually what yeah. I was thinking about was uh, uh, on my topic of smart grids. So uh, normally would you think about the system is on the distribution side, so local systems. And what what you see happening is that in new uh, new urban areas, there is more and more an interest for doing it right from the start. So, put solar panels up on the top buildings put uh, he, uh, combined heat and powers into the ground, uh, install uh, heat networks, just doing it right from the start. And I think that's a big shift towards. Yeah, towards local systems because you have these uh, greenfield projects and the possibility to go for investments which are long-term sustainable. And therefore, uh, for both in greenfield projects and for uh, projects which are in, in, uh, in developing countries, I believe this interest for these local solutions is really there. So, um, yeah, and then the push from top down maybe not that much needed for such projects, but just a support from the local municipalities would be really required. I, I'd like to step in as, uh, this is from an academic point of view because you said local versus, let's say, a hier hierarchical approach. I think there is a gap in the sense that most of the environmental policies that we looked into are made at the national level. But the investment decisions, let's say on R&D expenditure decisions, are made at the company level. I don't think there has been anything done on how national level policies impact investment decision making on clean energy or energy innovation at the company level. So there is a, there is a nice little paper, something called a hierarchical approach or a multi-level approach of national policies in impacting uh, decision making on R&D. So I think this is worth looking into on this side. Let me uh, open it up to questions from the floor and then uh, I've got more that we can add in. So. Yeah, it's, um, Barry Gills, Professor of Development Studies at the University of Helsinki. Um, Alexander Gershenkron uh, famously used the phrase, pardon the phrase, the advantages of backwardness. When looking at um, technological and innovation history and the relationship to development history, that therefore it could be seen as an opportunity that vast investments in the old generation of um, energy production, distribution, and so on, infrastructures, doesn't exist in some places. Then if we say that if we, if we, if we link up this energy revolution which we need to a um, zero carbon system, and we need it urgently, then the rural, rural electrification 
um, arena around the world is an enormous opportunity. And that could combine micro-generation using the new renewables, preferably only the new renewables, with the new smart grid technology. The question, therefore, comes to development finance. The development finance mechanisms are the key, the planning mechanisms as well. But uh, then that's the question I want to ask you. you know, what, what's your view about the politics of that at the moment? And uh, whatever opportunities exist or strategies should exist, or you know, how you think we can, that can be moved forward, looking at it more positively. Because potentially it could be a huge aspect uh, contributing to an energy revolution around the planet and lowering, having low energy costs for the majority of the poor in the world as well. Uh, and lowering all these other externality costs for them and for everyone else as well, right? Um, so there seems to be a, a, a compelling argument that the finance should be available. So where is it and how can we get it? Miguel, you want me to start? I, I, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll start a comment and a, and a conversation about it. So, I mean, you're absolutely right on both fronts. Um, one is the planning so that how do you how do you better inform planning and particularly planning that takes into account long-lived assets uh, and the complexities of energy water development and zero carbon or getting toward low carbon? That's one. So that's data, tools. It's also a lot of teaching, capacity building, because it tends to be that the decision makers within the planning complex, and that's energy, environment, and finance, I would say those ministries typically tend to be uh, slightly of older generation and therefore have grown up with a paradigm that they believe that centralized fossil fuel and or others is the answer because that's what they saw in their lifetime. And so um, in some sense, it takes a little bit of a, of a, I call it a generational nudge, maybe, maybe more than a nudge, maybe a kick, um, to get them to embrace uh, innovative solutions and new energy technologies, and or it takes really good, I'll call it modern data, tools, visualization, realization capabilities, and case studies, and walking them around and showing them. It's like people don't believe that you know, that the sea ice is melting as fast as it is because they haven't seen it, right? And so do you show them a movie or do you actually take them there? And sometimes they believe the movie, sometimes you just have to get them there themselves. That's one side. The second side is development finance. And here, um, I'm gonna defer to Channing to talk a little bit more about this, but I'm gonna give you two perspectives on it. One is that the availability of money is not the issue. I have a lot of conversations and relationships with folks inside the investment community, and there is an enormous amount of money waiting to be put to use for the right return. The question is, is for the right return at the right risk? And there's the, the, the real, I guess, um, gap for development finance to play, which is particularly for developing countries and for economics is development finance should, should, in my opinion, play a risk reduction, high leverage role, not its traditional, quote unquote, role that it started out with 20 or 30 or 40 or maybe more years ago, which was actually to pay for things. And that mode and that model has proven uh, grossly uh, inadequate. Uh, for the last at least 20 years or 30 years that I've been involved in development work with energy related pieces. And then the third piece of that is that the technical assistance that needs to go with development finance needs to really work with the governments to put the enabling investment environment in place to allow the private sector money to come in. And as long as the private sector money feels as though they've got risk adjusted returns that are appropriately um, penciled out, they will bring money into those countries at the right scale. They, it's rare that you'll find good institutional investors investing in anything sub, you know, $100 million or more at a chunk. And therefore, that, you know, you have to think about what the scale is on that front. Those are my initial reactions, but we'll turn to you all. 
So, um, yeah, I, I really, uh, I agree. I think Doug has made some really good points. I think that, um, you know, we both talking about your advantages of backwardness, and this is, you know, one of, this is one of the few things. One of the things just to, uh, you know, about making changes, the, the proliferation of cell phones in, in developing countries it has, is, is an enormously helpful thing uh, because, you know, you can really talk about leapfrogging in, in a really tangible way, right? And so <laughs> when you talk about moving to energy systems, you can talk about, you know, what has happened in your, in your phone system. I work a lot in Mozambique. And now, you know, they, I mean, for a long time, um, Maputo had much better cell phone service than, than the United States. Uh, and, and uh, the, you know, it, it's now penetrating into the, the, the rural areas. I think what Doug says is entirely correct in that the, the, either the technologies in terms of, say, for distributed generation in renewable areas, they're either right there or they're, or they're coming at us very, very fast. Right. So, and and it's a bit like what Sherelle was talking about. <clears throat> we now have to. This falls now on, on this audience. You know, in in a way, the engineers have done. They've done their bit, right? In in a sense, the the technologies are are there. Now we need the institutional mechanisms and environments to get them out into the it, where and and get them to to, to actually work. Uh, and and this is. Uh, so, I think as Sherelle was saying and, and Doug emphasized, you know, if, if you just simply go and you have finance and you just plunk a panel down somewhere, that, that's, that's, that, that might not work. We need, to, we need to pilot and work with systems that are going to make for, you know, proper repayment of these, of these systems. Um, and, and, and that will bring the finance. Uh, along with it. If, if they're going to get a return, then there's, there, there's quite a bit of finance there. There, there is role, there's serious public role for uh, de-risking, what my French colleague always says, <laughs> um, of, of these investments. The other problem with or issue with renewable investments is, is this very high sort of fixed cost and pretty low marginal cost, which, which makes the finance aspect uh, uh, very, very important. But, but there, I think there's two things that are clear. One is almost surely not going to mobilize the kind of public flows that would be required to make all of these in, in investments. And that, that's, the second is what I was saying is there is quite a lot of, of private capital that's out there that could, that could do it if, if the institutional setup is, is correct, which is why I think it, it comes back uh, to to you know what we're trying to do, it's why we're doing the book. It's and it's why uh, we're partnering with Enrel and 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 working on this at at Wide. No, I agree with Doug, and I just want to pick up on what um, Channing said that with development finance, case in point, Bangladesh, a poster child of climate change impacts. I think the finance is more or less there. Go the government of Bangladesh has already spent $500 million of its own money and is sitting on a pile of other allocation. But the problem in a country like Bangladesh is spending the money. In a country like Bangladesh, now it has, more di now it has become more difficult to, uh, to, get the fun to spend the money than to get the funds. And again, this is where Channing just said that it's the institutional capacity, the governance quality that has to be improved for private investors to come in and fill up whatever gap, if there is a gap in a country like Bangladesh. Yeah, and maybe just a little different perspective here is instead of just looking from the institutional side that that has to be fixed or finance that comes from the government side, uh, there is also an example in India of the company Rural Spark, which is actually just a pro for profit organization, a company that is providing solar panels to local uh, consumers and by subscription consumers pay a monthly payment uh, for this panel and um, so using a mobile phone which everybody has at that moment they just activate the panel and they have to keep paying it and in that way uh, Actually, it, there is just a private organization involved with the supply of electricity. So I think there can be new business models, which we don't even think of yet, that should really go into these rural areas as well. 
question. Yeah, up here, uh, if you would, thanks. All right, thank you. I have I have some experience I wanted to share. So uh, before before COP twenty one, you know the major issue was I mean reducing emissions and others, but African countries came out. I mean they brought in an argument because most of the countries were experiencing really intense power outages. So they I mean they put forward a proposal to link the two. So it was more energy climate measures, and they argue that okay of course I mean we we are open to adopting um, renewable technologies and the in increasing investments in renewable energy. But we need the light. So it was more of a po policy priority, whilst the, I mean, globally we want to, you know, transition to a clean energy uh, path. They also wanted to see light in their homes or to, I mean, make sure there is power, at least to make sure most of the uh, vital economic sectors are functioning well. So that was, I mean, the two, uh, maybe, I, I mean, a, a, a clash, I mean, of, of priorities, which, which was really essential for them. So, I mean, one, um, I, I listened to a former president of Nigeria, Uba Sanyo, saying, I mean, what is, what is solar? If, if, if uh, Mozambique has coal, Mozambique should go ahead and use the coal to give itself power. If, I mean, if Ghana has, I mean, oil, just use the oil to power yourself. I mean, because he said, I mean, the implementation of, I mean, renewable technology uh, takes time. That was his argument. So for me, it's, it's basically that we come down to this reality that these governments need more power than you, you, t you will think of that they need uh, uh, renewable energy, which will reduce emission. I mean, the African countries argue anyway that we contribute minus South Africa. South Saharan Africa contribute less than 5% of global emissions. So for them, what they really want to do is, is to make sure there's light at every home, so there's light to power factories and industries. And second, there was also, I mean, on the issue of finance. And looking at, I mean, African countries, definitely, I mean, there are two issues. First is that there is this lack of, I mean, priority, our political will to invest in energy. So apparently on current levels, African countries together, Sub-Saharan Africa, they invest about $8 billion annually in the energy sector, which is point, this is 0.4% of their GDP, of, I mean, combined. So apparently it's really less. If you look at the energy investments, I mean, the, that really also testify, or I, I mean, attest to the fact that, I mean, they have really, I mean, intense power outages and then power shortages. And then there was also one issue about the fact that even of the amount they invest, there are some inefficiencies. And these inefficiencies are linked to political patronage and then linked to mis, I mean, misinvestment. They just invest in maintenance and if, I mean, maintaining all the I mean, facilities rather than investing in more of the energy I mean, facilities. So it costs African countries almost $80 billion annually. And you can talk of Tanzania two, I mean, two years ago, where the, the energy utility provider I mean, was stuck in this, uh, uh, this scandal where I mean, billions of dollars were missing from the account offshore. So these are I mean, some of the issues we should. So finance is first, how much are they investing? And then second, how much of, of the investments are going you know, in the wrong pockets? And that, I think, should be considered in, in the, these discussions. Go, go to, goes to the institutional uh, governance issues. But let me, so let me, uh, let me just respond uh, initially, and then you guys can, can chime in. So first, uh, I'm, I'm relatively sure that one can build, in fact, I'm 100% sure that one could build 500 megawatts of wind and solar uh, 10 times faster than a coal plant. 10 times faster. You could, you, if you commissioned it, got it, got a contract signed, typically that would be built in less than one year uh, from literally rough ground into final. So the, the pace issue is actually a benefit to renewables. The resource issue, I, um, if I can calculate off the top of my head, the renewable resources in the countries you just mentioned, they have more than adequate renewable resource to provide power at 
European consumption demand to every uh, person in those countries just based upon uh, renewable resources. And so you could leave all of the carbon in the ground and have a complete renewable energy system uh, in a shorter period of time than extracting the carbon. To your third point, which is, in fact, it's the institutional arrangements which are the largest barrier to achieving that kind of a future. And your example of missing money, things like that, the tax structures and things like that, are in fact probably one of the largest components, particularly in those countries, but many others. But now I'll turn to my co-panelists to add some comments. I mean, I think you know, this is what I was speaking about in, in terms of, of less straightforward, right? I mean, uh, I work in Mozambique all the time, right? And, and so it's really easy to think about sticking a coal plant at the mouth of the mine in Tet and, and running a, a, a wire, you know, to, to, the, to the power pool, to the power pool net uh, network. And, and, you know, and, and, and there's going to be fossil fuel use in, in Africa uh, for, and, and there, you're going to build stuff. So th there is a matter of, of balance. I mean, this, this isn't going to happen um, right away. But there, there are, you know, alternatives. Um, you know, the first thing to think about is, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of, uh, I think what Doug mentioned, I mean, to, to do that scale power plant in Tet is a, you know, that's a complicated proposition. It's gonna take a long time to build that power plant, right? And, uh, and, and you're gonna have to build the wires to bring it, to bring and, it down. And, and you need right? the water. And you need the water. Uh, and, and so the, there's just that set uh, of issues right there. And then, you know, what are you gonna, you've gotta, you want to join Probably there are sort of political issues that, that kick in right away. South Africa already has a, a pretty ambitious INDC. South Africa is in the middle of, you know, sort of reducing, trying to reduce its, it's supposed to peak in, in 2030. That, that's they're trying to get, sort of shut down a bunch of coal, coal fired plants. They're not gonna buy Mozambican coal fired power. And so you're gonna, you're gonna sort of kick yourself out of, out of the power pool. If we continue to get uh, innovation at the pace that we're, 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 we're getting, you, you do have the possibility, and this would be you know, unfortunate, of building a power plant, running it for a few, you know, taking a long time to get it done, running it for a few years, and then having it essentially be obsolete. Uh, it's not, I'm not saying the, this is, it's less straightforward. Uh, it's, it's not as, as easy to, to, to think about it, and, and in part because of, you know, the models that we have fairly clearly uh, in, in our minds. Um, but but uh, what, what's becoming increasingly clear is, is that, you know, the, the alternatives are just plain better in a, in a large number of circumstances and, and actually very, very close at this point. I think the, the delay issue is... Is 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 really large, uh, and and just with the pace of, of technical advance, and this is really, uh, you know, I work with the Treasury in South Africa, and one of the most potent arguments I think we bring against a, a really big nuclear build is why are you locking yourself into one particular very large power source when there's so much stuff that's going on, uh, you know, that's it's already marginal at best, and and maybe it's. Plus, you're not going to see that power for seven years, you know, under the best of circumstances. Uh, whereas, you know, in, in developing countries, this issue of, you know, we have, we, we have the issue of um, with renewables, you know, it becomes, you know, it gets to be night every day, right? And so we don't, we don't generate that power. It's not windy everywhere. We have to balance that, that system. But you also have the larger scale balance. This is the, the root of African lack of power isn't, it is, I think fundamentally, is the 20 years from the 80s and into the 90s when Africa didn't grow at all. 
So when I was in meetings in 2005, you know, and trying to say, geez, we'd better build power plants and roads and all this stuff because the economy is going to take off and there's going to be a lot of power demand, you practically get laughed out of the room at the time. But with the, you know, we're now here we are 11 years later, that's how long it takes to do these things under the, the traditional system. And, 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 and power is, uh, is a big constraint. So, uh, you know, there's the system variability that's going on, you know, at an hourly or minute level. But there's also the, 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 the matter of balancing, you know, your sort of aggregate ability to supply uh, in a lumpy way with, with your demands. And in a developing country setting, your demands are really difficult to predict. I mean, it's not like Finland, which, you know, is going to have relatively consistent power demand going out for, you know, quite a few years. Most African countries could either, you know, what's the range? Well, we could grow by 7% a year for 10 years, in which case, you know, we, we've now uh, uh, doubled in size, or, or actually, you know, we could do rather poorly. These are, this is a big uh, range, and the ability to modularly add is, 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 is very important in that setup. And actually, frankly, most of the models that, we, that I've used don't take into account uh, very well that, that aspect. I would say. True. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Another question, comment? We've got one in the front. And then, uh, then we're going to go to a coffee break. Yeah, we're going to go to a coffee break. Here. Yeah. A medical doctor, sorry for my stupid question. No stupid question. I'm from Africa, West Africa, Guinea. My Aunt and cousin in the rural, remote rural area are using cellular phone. And my concern is, is, is it because the innovation is not really ready? Some time ago, the telephone landline was very crucial step to develop in the rural area. Today we have a cellular phone, mobile phone, that solve a lot of problems. My concern at this step, can we say that we didn't get strong enough technology to make affordable all these uh, electricity and power issue? Mm -hmm. If I took uh, in uh, my country, there is a lot of river, there is a lot of potential, sun is always there, but we are still facing with all this crucial need of electricity. If I run a lab, in my lab I need electricity. That was a shock for me when I returned to my country. I would like to invest in the lab, laboratory to, but there is no electricity. That is a very crucial thing. Is maybe the innovation is not ready or is something who is, uh, uh, we, are, we are not uh, reaching the, the, good, uh, the good target. Do you want to start? You want me to? Terrell? Well, so, so I'll, I'll do the, the crisp answer, which is that today, um, distributed technologies, I, I guess you're going to ask about distributed technologies, but also uh, hybrid systems. So they could be mini grid systems for villages, they could be based upon a, with a school and a health clinic and maybe producing water and purifying water, et cetera. So it's a bit bigger than just a household. Are technically viable, and there are multiple business models available like Terrell talked about, et cetera, utilizing cell phone services for payments, et cetera. They tend to be much less expensive than the current energy that's purchased by rural households today, which tends to be kerosene and batteries, tend to be also be much healthier. But they're more expensive than comparing against, I call it, the traditional grid-provided electricity. Um, so there's still more movement to go in terms of getting distributed generation to be as cost-effective as grid-based power. Again, 
agnostic of or ignoring the subsidies and the public health impacts and the climate change impacts. So it's, an, it's a little bit of an unfair comparison, but it's a lot closer than it was. And I think the interesting piece in your comparison against cell phones is self, there are now um, seven or eight billion cell phones in the world, I think. It's more than, it's more than one to one, right? Yeah, something close to that. Yeah, maybe it's a little less, maybe it's five. But anyways, I mean, th th they have proliferated uh, across the globe and with an enormous economy of scale. And if you compare the economy of scale growth of phones to the economy of scale growth of, 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 of photovoltaics, photovoltaics are not very far behind and they're on a similar growth path. Um, and so don't be surprised to see more and more cost effective solutions even in the near term future. But I'll turn to these guys. I just, I wanted to, I, I, do you want to add to there? No. I, uh, thank you all for coming. I wanted to add one point on complexities between local and, and global, which we talk about in the, in the book and I think is important, is uh, just looking further forward. I think that uh, you know, what we say uh, is this bottom up approach has been extremely effective for, for getting going. Uh, you know, there are now a bunch of things on the table and there's a, there's a lot of things happening. And a fact that I thought Doug would mention that he, that he didn't mention uh, is, is, you know, more than half of new installed capacity globally for 2014 and 2015 was renewable, right? It was, and, and billions and billions are being invested by private parties. So this is not, we're not sort of just kind of talking in the abstract. We're talking about more than half of capacity that, that, that's going in. A lot more needs to be done, um, but you know, at this point, in, partly it's easy, and maybe technology will 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 sort of smooth the path. Maybe you know, if you if you go very very fast, uh, but right now, uh, you know, we're going to need monitoring kind of. We're going to need to sort of know what other countries are doing. Uh, we don't want energy. We want energy intensive industries to move to areas with high sort of low clean energy potential not to areas where, you know, coal is cheap. Uh, and, and so this kind of, of inter dealing with uh, the global issue uh, is, is, is complex and isn't really handled within, within Paris. And, uh, and so as we look at going to uh, a new, you know, a, a deeper agreement to achieve the kinds of emission reductions that, that Doug was talking about, getting to down to you know very low levels around mid around mid century, we're going to encounter a different, a, a further set of complexities between global and local than 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 this agreement has come to to address at at this point. So thank you all for coming. I think we've managed to keep, well, we started a bit late and we're finishing roughly right on time. So uh, thank you for coming and, um, and we'll look forward to the next day. Thanks.